What's happening everyone? In this video I'll be covering the single layer perceptron, which is the most fundamental of all neural network elements, and a thorough understanding of it is certainly required before you get to the more complex topics in the field. Note that a single layer perceptron is essentially synonymous with simply perceptron, so I'll be using both names interchangeably throughout the rest of this video. The element found in nature most similar to a perceptron is a neuron, so many times you'll also hear those two words used together. In the beginning of this lesson, we'll briefly cover the history of the perceptron, then move into the basics of how the element actually works in practice. Around the halfway mark, we'll switch over to a coding editor and actually implement a single layer perceptron and trade in on some data using the Python coding language. In the description of this video, I'll post a link to a pretty amazing free machine learning textbook if you're interested. It just came out this past year and covers a wide range of topics. You also have the option to purchase a paper copy on Amazon if you'd like to support the authors. As always, if you find the video interesting or informative, consider throwing me a thumbs up. Also, think about subscribing to my channel if you'd like to stay up to date on the rest of my Python coding tutorials. So to start things off, the perceptron algorithm was invented way back in 1957 by Frank Rosenblatt while working at the Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory with funding by the U.S. Office of Naval Research. Soon after, the algorithm was built into custom hardware called the Mark I Perceptron, a machine designed for the purpose of image recognition. It contained an array of 400 photoreceptors which were randomly connected to the perceptrons, or neurons, of the computer. Although the perceptron initially seemed promising, researchers quickly proved that perceptrons could not be trained to recognize very large of a variety of different data patterns. We'll get into why that is later on. But for now, suffice to say, this realization caused a pretty major slowdown in the area of AI research. Fairly soon after, the funding picked back up again after it was shown that far more data patterns could be recognized if we just stacked perceptrons, what we now call multi-layer perceptrons. We won't get into too many of the specifics of MLPs in this video, but stay tuned because I'll be coming out with a video covering those in the coming weeks. Even though it may sound complicated, the perceptron is actually an amazingly simple element. On the left-hand side of the picture, as we can see here, the first step is to feed any number of inputs into the perceptron. We nearly always set the first input to a static one value, called the bias input. The reason why is a little more complicated, but essentially, by adding in a single static input, we give the perceptron the ability to move its decision boundary away from the origin, if the data the perceptron is being fit to requires that. The next thing that happens is that the input values are fed through weights, a single weight per input. The weights act by multiplying the inputs by their current weight value, creating a new value. For example, if we had an input value of one half being fed into a weight with value one, our output would simply be one half times one, or one half. After the inputs have been weighted, they're sent to the third step, the weighted sum, which simply adds all of them up and creates a single output value. Now in the final stage, called the step function in the diagram, we perform a check to see if the single value is above a certain threshold. If so, we output a 1. If not, we output a 0. And that right there is everything that happens inside of the perceptron. If you don't think you really have a grasp on it yet, you could try to pause the video now and go through the steps as I've written them on the right half of this slide. But on the next slide, we'll be going through the mathematical representation of the process. So that should also help to share things up. So, once again, the first thing we're doing here is creating the inputs and the weights. In a real application, the inputs could be, for example, XYZ coordinates, and we could be trying to predict whether or not the coordinates were pointing to a car or a plane. The car and the plane would be enumerated such that a car output would be signified as a 1, and a plane output signified as a 0, or vice versa. On the next line, we're creating a new placeholder variable called A, which will be set equal to the weighted sum of all the inputs multiplied by their respective weights. On the last line, we're producing our final output by comparing A to the threshold value of 1. If A is greater than 1, we output a 1, signifying a car in our earlier example, or a 0, signifying a plane. Take note that during the training process, it's the job of our perceptron to learn the weights, which will cause it to accurately predict outputs when provided a set of input values. After the perceptron has been trained, the idea is that it will have the ability to accurately predict outputs even when provided with inputs that it has never seen before, so inputs that were not on the training set. The major downside to the simplicity of a single layer perceptron is that it can only accurately differentiate between linearly separable sets. For example, 
in a single dimension, this would allow you to differentiate numbers larger than a certain value from those smaller. In two dimensions, this means you can accurately tell apart data if it can be separated by a single straight line. And for three dimensions, it's pretty much the same, but the line turns into a flat plane. So in these examples here on the right, you can see that we wouldn't be able to draw a straight line to separate these two sets of data. In this case here, we'd have to draw a circle if we wanted to separate the red dots from the green dots. And then in this case, we'd have to draw some sort of hyperbolic function if we wanted to separate these two sets. If we did wish to write a classifier to be able to differentiate between this set and this hyperbolic set, we would need to use something a little bit more complex, such as a multilayer perceptron. If we take a look at our plane example, uh, we can see that on this slide we would be able to differentiate between the planes and the cars uh, because if you imagine you could separate the cars and planes with a single flat sheet placed anywhere between the lowest altitude plane and the highest car. But on this slide we can see that one of the cars is on the top of a mountain, making it higher in elevation than the lowest plane. In this case, if this was the training data, we would never be able to get 100% accuracy because we would never be able to figure out a way to draw a flat sheet to separate all the planes and cars. Even if you tried putting the sheet at an angle, you still wouldn't be able to separate any of the cars and planes. In the next couple slides, we'll talk a bit more about the training process and how we figure out how to update the weights, and then we'll get to coding the actual perceptron. All of the inputs and desired outputs are provided to the perceptron during the training process. Normally in a single matrix where each row is a single training set, and the last column of each row signifies the desired output. When training the perceptron, we first initialize all the different weights. The weights may be initialized to zero, or to some small random value. Then for each example in our training set, we perform the following steps over each input and desired output. First we calculate the predicted output given the inputs and our current weight values. Next we calculate the error, which is the difference between our predicted output and the desired output. Finally, we update each of the weights by adding to them the product of the overall error and the prior input to that specific weight. In the picture on the right, we can see how the perceptron's hyperplane, separating the differentiated sets, is slowly changed as more training samples are presented. So in the beginning here, we just have uh, a simple straight line separating the single cat and the single dog. But then as we add in another dog sample, we can see that the slope of the line uh, decreases a little bit to accommodate the newer dog. And then same thing continues down in these two examples, except it gets a little bit more specific as we add more and more samples. Note that if we were to add another dog sample somewhere around here, we wouldn't then be able to differentiate between the dogs and the cats because we would have a curved uh, hyperplane. Somewhat difficult to actually explain what's going on in the training process uh, just using math equations. So you'll get a much better understanding once we move over to a coding editor and actually implement the training function itself. So now that we have our coding editor open, first thing we're going to be doing is covering the import statements. We'll be importing the print function from future, which effectively allows you to use the Python 3 print function in Python 2.7. Second import is going to be the sys module. This is going to be allowing us to use the sys.standardout.write, which is an alternative to using the print function. Third input is going to be uh, pyplot from the matplotlib library. This allows us to just output our data points along with our decision boundary or hyperplane. And the last import is going to be NumPy, which we won't actually be using in this tutorial, but it'll be used in the plot function that I'll just be pasting in. So um, if you guys would like to actually take a closer look at the plot function, I'll be posting a link in the description to my GitHub repository that actually has the entirety of the source code. So definitely take some time to look over that if you're wondering what's going to be going on inside of the plot function. Next thing we're doing here is writing out all of our input data. The first column pertains to the bias input. As you can see, every single bias input is set to 1.0. The second and third inputs, um, so on the first row, 0 0.08 and 0 0.72, are considered the two actual inputs into the neuron besides the bias input. Um, you could say these are X and Y inputs. And as you'll see uh, soon enough, once we plot the data, you'll get a better idea of how these all line up. Um, and then the fourth and final input in the fourth column is the actual classification of the data. So that's going to be the output that we're trying to fit 
our weights to. So now we've pasted in our plot function and passed in our input matrix as the parameter. And we can see our data set plotted out on a uh, XY plane. As you should recognize immediately, this is linearly separable data. Um, you can tell because you could just draw a straight line, basically a line of slope negative one starting in the top left and going down to the bottom right. You'd be able to accurately split the red dots from all the blue dots. After writing in our three randomized weights, we're going to now write out our predict function, which is provided our input values as well as our weights currently in our perceptron. And we'll iterate over each one of the inputs and calculate the predicted output following the same equations we talked about earlier. Notice the threshold function is accomplished on the last line where we're going to be returning 1 if our total activation was above the threshold. Otherwise we'll be returning 0. The last function we'll be implementing here before we get to our train weights function is an accuracy function. This has also provided our input matrix along with our current weights and it returns the percentage correct. So it goes through and calculates what our prediction was for every single one of the inputs and then compares that to what the actual desired output was. This function will be used inside of our train weights function to figure out if we can stop early if we've already reached 100% accuracy. Now that we've got all the helper functions out of the way, we can begin to write our actual train weights function. The inputs are our data matrix, our current weights, number of epochs, which is essentially the maximum number of times we're going to go through and try to train the weights. Then we have the learning rate, which we set to a default of 1.0. With 1.0 it shouldn't really affect anything, but if you did a lower learning rate, you'd be changing the weights uh, by a smaller amount on each one of the iterations. So it may take longer to eventually get to the correct uh, outcome. If you increased it, it would be changing the weights more, but then that also might slow it down if it's overshooting itself every time by adjusting the weights too much. Fifth input, do plot, uh, which is set to false by default. If it's set to true, then on each epoch we're going to plot out our current progress on separating the two data sets. When we go through and run this the first time, I'll show you guys an example of uh, this being set to true so we can see the progression as our hyperplane begins to separate the two sets of data. Next input, stop early, is set to true by default. And if we ever get to an accuracy of 100% before reaching our maximum number of epochs, then we'll just quit out early instead of running through the rest of the epochs because they're not going to change anything. Then the final input, verbose, um, when set to true, we'll just be printing out more information to the terminal, such as how much each weight is being updated on each epoch, um, what the current accuracy is, etc. So now we're going to create a for loop that's going to iterate for the number of times that we have epochs in the number of epochs input. First thing we're doing inside of the for loop is calculating our current accuracy using our accuracy helper function. We'll then print that out along with the current epoch number as well as our current weight values. We'll then check and see if we have both 100% accuracy and our stop early is set to true, in which case we'll break out of the for loop. We're then going to check if we have two plots set to true, in which case we're going to plot out our current hyperplane. After that, we're going to enter into another nested for loop where we're going to iterate over each one of the samples in the data set. For each sample, we're going to get our predicted value using our helper predict function. We're then going to calculate the error by subtracting our predicted value from the actual desired value at that row in the matrix. If Ferbos is set to true, we're now going to print out uh, just a statement saying we're training on the data at index i, so that's just going to be which row in the matrix we're training on currently. We're now going to iterate over each one of the weights in our perceptron 
and update it based on what our error was. The actual equation is weights of j equals weights of j plus the product of learning rate times error times the input to that exact weight on that last run. Again, if verbose is set to true, we're going to write out the actual weight change that just occurred by saying uh, what, the, what the initial weight was and then also printing out what the final weight was after making the change. Even if do plot is set to false, at the end of the entire iteration, whether or not we broke out because we had 100% accuracy or because we used up all of our allotted epochs, we're going to be printing out our final results with the title of final epoch and then at the end return uh, the weights we found that best fit the matrix we had input. So now I'll move back down to the main function and test out the train weights function. We'll obviously be passing our data as the input data using our randomized weights as the weights using 10 as the maximum number of epochs. Just using the default learning rate uh, setting do plot to true so on each epoch we're going to get a plot showing our progress in developing the hyperplane. And stop early set to true as well so that once we hit 100% accuracy, if we do, we won't run through all the extra epochs at the end. Now we can switch back over to terminal and try running the code. We can see after the first epoch, our initial randomized weights have got us an accuracy of 50%. And with the plot that opens up, we can see our hyperplane placement. So as soon as we close out of the plot, it'll start the next epoch. So now we can see we still have 50% accuracy, but it achieved that just by guessing that everything was of the red class, instead of splitting it down the center and getting 50% of them wrong as well. Now we can start to see the blue classification coming back into play in the bottom left. Same idea here again, except it moved a little bit farther to the bottom left. And here we can see this is going to be our last epoch because we have 100% accuracy. And we can see we've placed our hyperplane going from about 0.8 on the y-axis down to probably 1.5 on the x-axis. And with this placement, we have 100% accuracy on all of the testing data. So assuming our testing data was representative of something in the real world, and all the elements in the real world actually fit into this um, situation where you could split them down the center, we would then be able to go on into the future and predict on uh, data that we hadn't seen in the training session. Just as an example, if we set do plot to false here, uh, we can run it again and we'll see that we skip through all the intermediary epochs and just print out the final epoch. So guys, I think that's going to be it for this video. If you enjoyed it or found it informative, be sure to throw me a thumbs up. In the coming weeks I'll probably do a video on a multilayer perceptron as well as continuing working on the uh, Python data structures playlist that I've already started. I think we have four or five videos in that playlist so far. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I'll see you in the next one.